and your intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Hello and welcome to the Sword of the Spirit, a school of ministry in the Word and the Spirit. Our topic this series is worship, worship in spirit and truth. And in recent programs, we've begun to look into the Old Testament to see how certain forms and patterns of worship that God ordained in Old Testament times reveal to us the deeper truth of New Testament spiritual worship. The Bible says that the Father is seeking for worshipers, those who would worship Him in spirit and truth. So we're exploring the relationship between Old Testament people and places, rites, ceremonies and different forms of worship which point towards the deeper reality of what's going on in our hearts. So as we teach on today's topic, I pray that you will experience more of the heart of worship to the Father in the name of Jesus. Now Old Testament types of worship were focused on prayer and sacrifice. Now we know that certain passages suggest that there were offerings of incense and we also see that in the book of Psalms we have singing, dancing, shouting and processions. All these were an integral part of Old Testament worship. Although we never ever get a detailed account of any one particular Old Testament worship situation. Uh, but we do know that worship centered on sacrifice because we read so many specific instructions for the offerings of sacrifices. And we looked at these in some detail in the Sword of the Spirit seminar on salvation by grace. People had worshipped God with sacrifices from the very beginning. Cain and Abel, they brought sacrifices to the Lord. And doubtless, that came as a result of what Adam and Eve taught them concerning God's sacrifice that he made with those animals and clothed them with animal skins, tunics, clothed their nakedness because of their sin. And uh, these sacrifices then were taught, and we know that Cain and Abel offered sacrifices, we know that Noah offered sacrifices, we know that Abraham was used to offering sacrifices, otherwise he would have questioned what was going on concerning the sacrifice of his own son, uh, he hadn't offered a human sacrifice, of course, but this was a special lamb, and he was, had the faith that God would provide a lamb for that sacrifice. We also know, too, that the Egyptians had to experience a whole series of plagues because they stood in the way of the children of God going out into the wilderness to offer sacrifices. And when we look at all of these things, especially that sacrifice that was made by the children of Israel having escaped from Egypt, uh, in the wilderness, we know that God is the one and the only one who will direct the sacrifices of his people. They had to wait until God showed them when they got there what they were supposed to do. And then when uh, we study these sacrifices, we see that God will only accept clean animals and birds which actually belong to the people. There had to be some element of genuine, costly self-denial. You couldn't sacrifice something that belonged to somebody else. It had to be yours, it had to be a clean animal, and it had to be what God instructed you to do. The tenth plague was an act of judgment of Egypt, but an act of redemption for Israel. And here we have the institution of the Passover and the Passover sacrifice. It was the beginning, it became the beginning of Israel's national life, but also it started off this whole season of organized regular national sacrifices. After the Passover, while God's people were still wandering in the wilderness, God instructed them about the sacrifices that were going to come. And it all began in the month of Abib with the Passover sacrifice. And when we study the Old Testament books, we find there were five principal ritualistic sacrifices. It's good to know all of these because each and every one of these gives us an indication of what God was looking for us in, looking from us in our lives. First of all, there was the holocaust or the burnt offering, the holy burnt offering. Secondly, there was the oblation or grain offering. Then number three, there was the communion or peace offering. Number four, the sin offering. And number five, the guilt, reparation or the trespass offering. Now looking at these individually, 
we can say that the oblation and communion sacrifices helped the people to express their feelings of being creatures who belonged to God. The Holocaust sacrifice represented the people's dedication and God's acceptance of everything that they had and were because nothing survived. In the whole burnt offering, everything was offered up and burnt completely. And so God was saying, I want all of you, and I'm going to accept all of you, the whole of you. And then the eating together by priests and people in the communion sacrifice reminded them of their vital relationship with God. But the sin and guilt sacrifices enabled the people both to display their human sense of separation from a holy God caused by their sin and guilt, and to cry out to God for him to cover it. And in all the sacrifices, only the best would do. Worshippers had to sacrifice in a way that depleted their own resources, their own personal resources. And it's unacceptable in, in uh, Old Testament law that you could uh, offer something that didn't rightfully or law lawfully belong to you. That's why David, when he was encouraged at the judgment of Jerusalem, uh, to, to offer a sacrifice. And Onan the Jebusite said, here, take, 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 I'll, I'll give you what you, to, to, to sacrifice. Uh, and, and he said, no, no, I'm not going to sacrifice to the Lord. It costs me nothing. And he gave him the full price for it. And all these ritual sacrifices were meant to be offered personally and nationally, privately and publicly, regularly as the needs arose. And we find that there were prescribed rituals of offerings and sacrifices and then seasons which fell daily, weekly, monthly, and even annually. And whenever the people of Israel turned to the Lord, they were supposed to worship him by offering sacrifices. The Old Testament shows that although the ritual sacrifices were made in different situations for a variety of reasons, the act of offering a sacrifice always followed a set pattern. God established it, and they had to follow that set pattern if they were going to honor him. So they worshiped God with sacrifices. But in the Old Testament, we also see that they worshiped God with singing and music. The book of Psalms teaches more about the worship of God's people than any other part of the Old Testament. And we're going to look at that in a whole session a little later on. And when we do look at the Psalms and other Old Testament descriptions of worship, we see that singing and music were important elements. Now we know that uh, part of the pagan pattern of worship was these ancient religious religions were encouraging people to work themselves up into a kind of a frenzy with their music. The prophets of Baal, for example, were worked up into a frenzy to try and encourage their God to answer by fire. Now we see too in 1 Samuel 10 that there were at times these almost frenzied bands of prophets of the Lord that would sometimes use music in the same way. It was not a pagan manifestation at all, but it just shows that music played a part. But we also need to know that not all music and spiritual singing is pleasing to God. Amos 5 and verse 23 says, Take away from me the noise of your songs, for I will not hear the melody of your stringed instruments. Now that is not a proof text against noisy guitar music in church services. What it actually is relating to is the attitude of heart. Quite frankly, I don't think that God has any one preferred style of worship, worship or music, but he, what he wants is the human heart in tune with him. And so he says, if you think that you're going to impress me with your fine music, and in your heart you're, you're turning away from me, you've got another thing coming. Nevertheless, God's people could not properly praise him without joyful singing and music. There's no way that you can have some kind of silent celebration. Joy, music, singing, and all the other expressions are part and parcel of what the Old Testament understood by praising God. Now, we know that it is natural for us to respond to God in the kind of worship that uh, is stimulated by His holy presence. And, uh, of course, it will always lead us to praise Him 
and to sing songs of praise. Now, we know that uh, there was instituted choirs, special choirs, to participate in the worship. We see this in 1 Chronicles chapter 15, verses 16 and onwards. Then David spoke to the Levites, the leaders of the Levites, to appoint their brethren to be the singers accompanied by instruments of music, stringed instruments, harps and cymbals, by raising the voice with resounding joy. So there were special choirs that were there to lead the worship and to express the worship of God's people. And these people were to be skilled. Now I know that God wants us to make a joyful noise. But somehow, when God anoints gifted singers and musicians to praise Him, we all uh, enjoy that. I personally don't sing very well. I, uh, uh, when I'm praising God, I've got to put on a tape in order to rem remember the tune and sing along with the tape. But sometimes even when that tape isn't played and I'm singing and praising to no recognizable tune in God's creation, it nevertheless is something wonderful to God because it's praise and worship from my heart. But how wonderful it is for me to join together with all those who can sing and praise God skillfully on musical instruments. And, and their celebration is an expression of what's on my heart. And, and, and don't feel too sorry for me because when I get to heaven, I'm pretty sure I put the order in now, I'm going to be able to sing. And I'm going to sing so beautifully. I'm, and if, if we're allowed to do such things, I'm going to hold a concert in praise of Jesus. And I, I want you all to be there. I'm inviting you now. Admission is free. And uh, we're going to sing together and praise God together. And whether we sing well or not on earth, our singing in heaven will be so transformed that we will sound like crows on the earth by comparison to what we're going to sing like in heaven. And so we know too that uh, some of the Psalms have a refrain, a chorus, which suggests that one part of the Psalm was sung by the worshippers and the rest was sung by the choir. And we see various psalms which, which, uh, which show that. And we also see that uh, God uh, called for such uh, variety and worship of instruments, tambourines, harps, lyres, trumpets, rattles, horns, flutes, cymbals. Let everything, praise God, make a joyful noise. We find the Old Testament worship was essentially joyful. Almost a carnival atmosphere about some of it. Look at Psalm 42 and verse 4. He says, When I remember these things, I pour out my soul within me, for I used to go with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God with a voice of joy and praise, with a multitude that kept a pilgrim feast. Very recently, a team and I have returned from the latest March for Jesus in Sao Paulo, Brazil, where it was estimated that upwards of two million people marched. I mean, that's the kind of atmosphere you expect. Uh, and these Brazilians know how to, how to march and sing and praise God with all of their wonderful Latin rhythms and their desire and fervor for God. And that, to me, it would be very, very similar to what I'd expect the Old Testament temple worship to have been like people singing and praising and shouting and dancing and enjoying everything that God is, a carnival atmosphere. Then we also know that the Old Testament speaks of dancing and drama. Some of the Psalms assume that there was dancing. Other Psalms actively encourage it. Psalm 26 and verse 6, very clear there. I wash my hands in innocence, so I'll go about your altar, O Lord. What does he mean, going about your altar? He's singing and dancing. That's what's happening. Psalm 150, verse 4. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with stringed instruments and flutes. Remember, even King David uh, was, uh, went about publicly dancing and was rebuked by his wife for looking so foolish. But he didn't care about it. He said, I'm going to praise God anyway. Now, we know they were praising and worshiping God with processions. We just read Psalm 42, verse 4. When I remember these things, I pour out my soul. I remember, he says, how I used to go with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God. They marched in and out of the city, and in and out of the temple and through the city with praise and with processions. 
Now, there's an indication, too, I want you to look closely at these verses, an indication, too, that in their worship, they actually acted out great events in a kind of dramatic fashion. Look at this, Psalm 48 and verse 8. As we have heard, so we have seen in the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God. God will establish it forever. As we have heard, so we have seen. And this suggests that symbolic actions and dramatic um, uh, presentations were reenactments of the things that God had done in the past history of the people of God to teach them about his power. So it suggests that there was some form of drama that was presented before the people so the people could not only hear God's powerful acts and deeds but see them as they were enacted out. So this certainly shows us a very colorful and creative aspect of worship. And I believe that we should be colorful and creative in our worship. We should use all of these things, dancing and drama and music and singing and shouting and responses from the people and in such a way in which it's active and interactive and, and the responses, of course, not just uh, between the people and God, but also between God and the people. We know, too, that the Old Testament people worship God through their prayer times. We know the New Testament records that there were regular times of prayer held in the New Testament, uh, in the, uh, uh, in the uh, temple of Jesus' day, but these are not mentioned in the Old Testament, although we can be absolutely sure that prayer was a vital part of worship in the Old Testament. We know in the Old Testament people would come with their prayer requests to the temple of the Lord, and although in Hannah's time, when uh, uh, just soon Hannah was, of course, Samuel's, Samuel's mother before Samuel was born. There was no temple built, but they came to the place where worship was made, to Shiloh, to where the tabernacle was. And people like ha Hannah could bring their problems to the Lord in prayer. We know, for example, too, in Deuteronomy chapter 26, uh, verses 5 and 10, that the law contained prayers that were expected to be used on certain occasions. And it says, And you shall answer and say before the Lord your father, My father was a Syrian about to perish, and he went down to Egypt and dwelt there, few in number, and there he became a nation, great and mighty and populous. And so there were written forms of prayer and uh, things that they were to say together to make declarations before God. And these were obviously used by individuals and by groups of worshippers. We know too that the Old Testament worshippers used many different bodily positions. The inner attitude, of course, was more, always more important than the outer posture, but they did use outward posture. 1 Kings 8 verse 22, Then Solomon stood before the altar, and the Lord in the presence of all the assembly of Israel, and spread his ha hands towards heaven. We hear of people clapping and praising God in their, in their applause. And it's something that is actually current now in charismatic worship. Personally, I think it's a little overdone. I think it's just now a habit. I mean, there's a song that hits a certain high point. Everybody just claps. They clap in between every song. They don't even know what they're doing anymore. And it's a pity. But the truth is, the fact of clapping is in the Old Testament. I remember one person uh, coming and, and criticizing this and, and trying to give Bible verses for it and saying, uh, Clapping belongs to Old Testament flesh worship. And in the New Testament, we don't clap anymore. Well, I don't know, but the last time I looked, I had a body. And the last time you looked, probably you had a body as well. And as long as you're on this earth, you're going to have a body. If you don't have a body, you're not here. Goodbye. You're in heaven. You're, you're, and, and you'll have a body there anyway when you're resurrected. So you're not going to get out of the body. Uh, and we are therefore worshiping God with all of our body. And in every culture throughout history, one of the spontaneous ways that people show excitement and joy is clapping. You don't, not necessarily in the stylized form, sitting in an auditorium where everybody knows at a certain moment you have to clap. It's a, it's a show of appreciation. I mean, children, even before they know about that, they get so excited. They clap their hands and they shake and have a wonderful time. And uh, we learn, need to learn how to praise God like little children, don't we? Are you sure? So, this is a spontaneous expression of 
fit in, in the physical way. And so raising your hands and shaking and waving your hands, these are stylized, ritualistic forms. Everybody up and wave and down again, a kind of Old Testament form of ancient aerobics. No, it's a spontaneous thing, spontaneous thing. that You wave your arms around because you're expressing something. And even sometimes the most inexpressive people express themselves. And some people who are very, very inexpressive have occasionally raised a hand at some football victory or some wonderful thing. I mean, whoever comes in who is so totally dead ban and say, when somebody's just given them a million dollars and say, thank you very much, I'm so excited for this gift you've given to me. God bless you. No, it'll be, oh, hallelujah, a million pounds. And if you don't believe it, just give me a million pounds and I'll show you how I'll react. <laughs> now, we know in the Old Testament that there were times for worship, set times for worship. Worship involved everything. It involved where they lived. It involved what they did, where they did it, how they did it and when they did it. God was available to his people at every time and in every place. But there were certain special times when God was, uh, called them to join together and celebrate his grace and goodness. One of these is the Sabbath. Sabbath. Sabbat means cessation or rest. When God rested on, his, uh, uh, on the seventh day, it wasn't as if he said, oh, boy, I've stretched myself over these last six days. I better sit down and have a rest. No, 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 he wasn't tired. Rest means cessation from one particular activity. And their pattern was set that we should learn how to cease, to rest, to let go of certain daily patterns of activity in order to concentrate upon God. And in the Old Testament, this was the Sabbath principle of desisting from work for one day a week based on God's personal example on Sabbath of Sabbath rest. And we find that the Sabbath was a day of rest when everyone we could cease from normal and regular activities, including slaves and foreigners, and renew themselves in the presence of God for work. It seems that Worship, then, was part of this Sabbath-renewing process. Many passages in the, in the Old Testament describe what happened on the Sabbath and show, unfortunately, not all the activities that people did pleased God. God was very clear about what they should do. It was a day of rest and a day of worship. And while we cannot strictly take this and make it a New Testament law, for we don't live under the prescriptions of the Old Testament Mosaic law, nevertheless, there is a principle here which we need to understand. Worship is when we take, well, God will call us to special seasons of worship, when we set ourselves apart from the regular activities and wait upon God with special sabbatical seasons. And for the Jews, it was a time to reflect on their national roots, to celebrate God's greatness, and to renew their commitment to the covenant faith of God. And this is why in the law, in Exodus chapter 20, the Ten Commandments, God orders His people to observe the Sabbath and to dedicate the whole day to the Lord. But we also see that in certain passages, it was a time of joy and celebration that this was something to celebrate. What a tragedy that some Christian Sabbatarians who would suggest that we need to keep the Sabbath just like Moses uh, kept the Sabbath and we are under the law of Moses as far as they're concerned, uh, forget that it was a joyful occasion. Uh, when Lewis, the senior pastor of Kensington Temple many years ago, used to say that when he was brought up in Wales, uh, the Sabbath was kept so holy that even the, the swing in the budgie cage was taken out just in case the budgie enjoyed himself on the Sabbath day. But here, 
In Isaiah 58, verses 13 to 14, it says, If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord, honorable, and shall honor him, not doing your own ways, not finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own way, words, then you shall delight yourself in the Lord, and I will cause you to ride on the high hills of the earth and feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father, the mouth of the Lord has spoken. God says, Whatever else you do, enjoy it. Enjoy me. It's a day of joyful celebration. And so this shows us that worship is essentially a celebration of God and a joyful recognition of who he is. After all, if the Bible is right, and it surely is, to say that we have been made for God, that we've been created for God and for His glory, when we turn our attention away from ourselves and we focus upon God, we find the fulfillment of our being. And that must also mean deep and abiding joy and celebration. That's why worship is so central in our lives as believers. That's why praise and thanksgiving must have a high priority in everything that we do. We must be characterized by worship and praise and thanksgiving because it is an expression of our fulfillment in God. And that's why so many people uh, find praise and worship so fulfilling. You will never find yourself more fulfilled as a human being than when you are abandoned in the presence of God and the Holy Spirit is bringing forth from your heart and life deep praise and worship as you respect the awesome presence of God and have fellowship in communion with Him. That's the heart of praise and worship and that's why the Father is seeking such as who would worship Him. Well, we're going to break at this particular point and come back to this section in the next session to go on from here to have a look at the importance and significance of the Passover in the life of the worshippers in the Old Testament and also what that has to do for us as New Testament worshippers. But in the meantime, remember, God is looking for you to be a worshipper, one who worships in spirit and truth. God bless you.